Um, hello, I would like to tell you some things about uh, polyglot persistence and multimodal databases. So this talk will be uh, about a short introduction into this NoSQL term, um, and then we'll point out what is this polyglot persistence, and we'll move over to features of multimodal databases and how they really fit into, the, into this content, concept of polyglot persistence. So a bit about myself. Um, my name is Michael Hackstein. Uh, I'm working on ArangoDB. I'm part of the ArangoDB core team, uh, which is based in Cologne. And I'm responsible for the web front end, graph visualization, graph features. Um, we have all that written in JavaScript, and I'm a JavaScript developer. Um, in my free time, I'm organizing Cologne.js. That is the uh, JavaScript user group in Cologne. And we also have a track here at FrostCon, which is upstairs in the project rooms. And I think today there will be three, uh, three more talks in that track. So if you're interested in JavaScript, you can come there. Um, in my professional life, I hold a master's degree with a specialization in databases and information systems. And that is how I got in touch with ArangoDB. But enough about myself. Let's start with my story. So some time ago, um, there was this kind of dogma that you could either use a relational database or you did something wrong. So actually, you just created always a relational database, put everything into one AR format, and if you have an additional, um, data, uh, an additional class or object in your application, you just add another table, connect that somehow. And if you do that a long time, something like this in a quite large system really ends up, and it's really hard to manage this and um, to get an overview of where is what. But the idea why you did that is that the normalized model is really space efficient, it's memory efficient, and it's quite fast on the database side. But the problem is you have to force your data format always into this relational normalized format, and you have to do that yourself. So you have to do that in the application code, and you cannot just store the native data object that you have in your application directly into the database. But with the rise of NoSQL, this actually changed. So to give you just an overview of the NoSQL database that are around, the three major types. The first one is the document database. So a document database actually stores mostly JSON documents, and you group them which, with logical similarity into collections. So to get the step from the relational world, a collection is basically the, quite equal to a table, but you do not have to define the column names beforehand. So the NoSQL document store can live with different attribute names in different objects in the same collection. Um, then you can also add queries and indices on top of these documents. So it's not a problem if there is some attribute which is not filled. That's simply ignored by the indexer. Um, but all the others can be really uh, getting really fast by, the, uh, by queries <coughs> if you have an, an index on a certain attribute. Um, then we have graph databases. The idea of graph databases is that they are really focused on M-to-N relations between objects. So an object is, again, some kind of document, but it typically cannot be that complex. So in a document store, it's also possible to store nested objects and objects and objects in objects and so on as one entry in the database. And you can query on the internal attributes also. This is typically not possible in graph databases. The idea of graph databases is you have simple documents, connect them to each other, and query on path lengths of, uh, on passes on arbitrary lengths. So on a graph database, it is easy to get um, from A to B with at most three steps in between. So one step, two step, or three steps. If you want to do that in a SQL query, you would have to write three subqueries. One for one level join, two level joins, and three level joins to get the same result. So for these queries, graph databases are really, really good. <coughs> and the last one, it's, I would say, the simplest one, key value store. The idea of a key value store is that you have one unique key that is unique in your complete database. And to this key, you connect any arbitrary object. The database doesn't know anything about this object. 
So it can store binary files or JSON or strings or whatever, it doesn't care. And you can only get this object back using the key. But you don't get query operations on the object level. You can just query by key. You cannot say, I know that in my objects is always the attribute name. You cannot get that. You have to put the name if you want to query that into the key for efficient querying. Uh, querying. <coughs> but because of this constraint that the database does not know anything of the content that it's storing, it is re really easy to implement scaling and partitioning because you just have this one key that is unique in your com complete database, use hash function on that, and then put it on any server. And you can just add millions of servers, and it's unique by your key which server stores this data. For a document store, for example, it's quite hard to get sharding. Because if, if you shard, you could still shard by any key for the, um, for the document. That's not a problem. But if you want to query it, you want to query on attribute level. And maybe the attribute is not the one that you sharded by. Then you have to connect, uh, collect the data from all the servers. That's why it's a bit harder to um, use sharding on document stores. <coughs> and on graph stores, it's even worse because you have to um, actually make sure that the vertices are on the same machine as the edge to get a fast query. <coughs> and that in both directions. So it's quite hard to really shard a graph database. That's why most graph databases don't even support it. But now let's talk about polyglot modeling. The idea of polyglot modeling or polyglot persistence is to use the right tool for your job. So you take a look at your application, what data you want to store, and then you pick the database that can natively store your data from it. So if you have a structured data like a JSON object, then you should probably use the document store because you just fire your uh, JSON object to the document store, it stores it, and no transformation has to be done, neither on your side nor on the database side. <coughs> um, and if you have relations between these objects or in simple objects and you want to query them efficiently along the passes, then you should probably use the graph database. <coughs> and if you say, okay, I don't care, I just want maximum performance, I don't want to query uh, on attribute level, and I want to manage the structure myself, then you can use key value store for it, because that is really fast on that point, um, and you can scale in it endlessly. <coughs> but if you have a mix of these, and I think most applications actually have that, then you could use a multimodal database. And what a multimodal database is, I will tell you in a few minutes. Let's go to a use case example, an e-commerce system. <coughs> so I think an e-commerce system is, in theory, quite simple. You have somewhere a product catalog where you put all your products in. In the relational world, you would have to normalize it because a t-shirt, a TV, these are two different entries, two different tables in a relational world. They have different attributes. In a document store, you can put that in the same collection because it's uh, it can handle that there are different formats in the same collection. <coughs> then you have your customers. You can also do that in a relational database, and they are quite similar, um, but also there are some problems. So if you are only in Germany, it's quite easy to make one customer um, table, and that's it. But if you support German addresses and, for example, American addresses or whatever addresses, they are also quite differently, so they need different attributes. And um, you could store that in a relational format using different tables, or store some JSON inside it, but then you lose actually the benefit of a relational database, because you cannot query JSON or other stuff inside um, your, your table cells. <coughs> um, next thing you have is a sales history on the top left side, which just, just stores which user bought which items and at which price and all this stuff. Um, then you have the shopping cart, the shopping cart, you want to be really, really fast and accessible because you need that on every page of your e-commerce system. <coughs> but the storage of it is quite simple, I would say. And the last thing is the most important thing uh, of a good e-commerce system is recommendations. Because you want to recommend good products to your buyers so they buy other products or also to get more money for you. Um, <coughs> but recommendations are actually a graph problem, because you have users connected to products, and 
other users buying the same product, and then you can suggest other products. And that's a graph query. So probably you would like to use a graph, query, um, a graph database for that. But anyway, you could do that in a relational database, like this. But it's, I think it's quite hard to manage, quite hard to handle, and quite hard to set up. <coughs> and it's, well, quite hard to get an overview. Um, if we are now moving to the NoSQL world, we have the same setup, the same e-commerce system. We still have the product catalog, which are simply documents in the same collection. And you actually don't care for all these different attributes. You just care for the same attributes that are shared between your products, like the price and stuff. Um, <coughs> and this is where you put the indices on. Then you have your customers where the document store, again, could live with different addresses and different address types, and also Nessus documents. <coughs> um, then you have the sales history, which is quite much the same. Then you have a shopping cart, where you actually just need the session ID and then some entry. But if you want to query that, you will only query that by session ID. You will never search for shopping carts containing a computer. We'll just have one user ID and get its shopping, his shopping cart, and that's it. <clears throat> and then for the recommendations, I already told you it's actually a graph problem. So you want to store the relations between product catalog and the customers in the graph database. And if we do that in nowadays most famous technologies, um, we would use the document store here, up there, and for the sales history, a key value store for the shopping cart, and a graph database for the recommendations. And with nowadays top leaders in these um, different categories. We could do this with MongoDB on the document store level, with Neo4g on the graph store level, and Redis, uh, for example, as a shopping cart. So these are just examples of different NoSQL databases that support this format. <coughs> so what are the benefits if you use this setup instead of one big relational setup? So the benefit is that you have a natural mapping of your data into your database. You store your graph in a draft database, you store your products in a document store, and your shopping cart in a key value store. <coughs> and you don't have to write any code to transform that or to optimize that, because the database is really built for these kind of data. Then you also get the queries that are tailored for your data format. So you don't have to create like huge SQL statements um, to simulate a graph query. You get that out of a box. <coughs> so Benefit, most of the benefit is that you can really focus on writing your business logic. You don't have to write any transformation code um, from your locally used data st uh, structure into the relational structure, no normalization required, anything. You can just simply use your data structure, store it, and that's it. Yes? Sure. Yes. That is actually one of the problems I'm coming to in, in a few minutes. <laughs> because most document stores actually don't support it. Um, OK, so, but what is the overhead that we get with this setup? Because you go, don't get anything for free. Um, so part of the overhead is that the data has to be stored redundantly and has to be kept in sync. So for the recommendation example, we need the graph query capabilities of the graph database but the actual content is stored in the document database. And we have to make sure that whatever is in the document, data, uh, document store is referenceable from the da uh, graph database, because we cannot connect the, those two together. <coughs> Next thing is you have to set up three different databases just to get your e-commerce system running. And that's a lot. So the administration is really a huge effort for such a system, I would say because that's a quite small system, and think of, think of a large-scale system with eight, with, age, with, with eight or more database technologies involved. It's really hard to manage. <coughs> and now I'm coming to your question, syncing requirements. So um, actually, you need relations between sales history, products, customers. Um, in many NoSQL document stores, you can do some kind of um, foreign key constraint, uh, um, I would say, but most of them don't offer joins. So um, you just have to do two queries and join that on your client side. So that is, again, code that you have to write yourself. 
or hopefully there's a library for that. But it just, the library just hides the problem of the database. Um, and the even worse syncing requirement is the recommendation. So I already told you, actually want references to the real object in your graph database. And if you want to um, query on certain attributes also, then you have to keep them uh, redundantly in the graph database also. So if you just, if someone searches for um, TVs and you would, you would not want to offer him a different TV if you just bought one, but you would, for example, offer him a DVD player or something. And that should be part of your graph query. And you do not want to do one step in the graph database, go back to your document store, look, oh, is that a DVD player? And go back to the graph, the graph database to suggest this one. <coughs> so it's quite a lot of effort that you have to put in your application to get that thing running. Um, but the good news is there's an alternative to that. So-called multimodal databases. The idea for multimodal database is that it can store different data formats natively. So it can store documents, it can store graphs, and it can store key values. And the idea of the graphs that it can store is that you simply use your documents from your document store and connect them in the graph. And the edges to the outside also appear as documents. So you can query the edges as documents, which gives you different opportunities, and you can query the documents as you're used to, but you can use the same documents in your graph query. And you don't have to write any application code to combine these ones and to keep them redundantly because it's in the same system, in the same database. <coughs> and it offers you all the query mechanisms for all the data models. So you get a query interface for graphs, you get a query interface for documents, and you get a query interface for key value pairs. Let's go back to the use case. So it's still the same setup. Um, we still want to use document stores, graph store, and key value store, but we could just use a multimodal database for all of that. And this leads me to RangoDB. So my favorite features of RangoDB, first thing is it's a multimodal database. So we can store graphs, documents, and key values. <clears throat> Next thing is, there's a query language. It is called AQL. Um, it is as powerful as SQL, I would say. And it is offering joins and traversals. That means that you can use this query, uh, this language to query your graph database inside and also get joins on the document level, which is not offered by many document stores. <clears throat> and also across multiple collections. And next thing is, RangoDB is completely asset, including multi-collection transactions. So you can actually store your documents in different collections, update them in one asset transaction. <coughs> and for those of you who can count, I wrote four features and just listed three. The last one is a feature that you don't expect from a database. Fox is our JavaScript framework. It is like comparable to Node.js, it is has some uh, built-in libraries. It has a JavaScript runtime, which is Google's V8. And you can use it to put JavaScript code on your database level and to adapt the API of the database to what you actually need. So if there is something missing and you need that, you can just wrote, write your own API in JavaScript that is entered into the, data, into the database and really acts on the raw data objects. So whenever you have something that you would put into your client analyze it and query again to the database from the result without user interaction or something, then you could put that into the database level, which is much faster. Because you don't have to transform it from A to B, you can just execute on, on the database level and put the complete result outside. Yeah? Is this that question? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Um, it is, um, the idea is actually that you make apps. So you can put apps into um, version control and you can then install them from your version control system into a RangoDB. So it's not as, it's quite comparable to the stored procedure, but you can manage your versioning yourself and you have it in your um, version control system. And you can just install it. 
Um, but I will have a slide on that uh, later on. <coughs> okay, so how does that look like now? HQL, the query language. Um, on top, we have a document query. So in this query, I will just get the users which are active, and then I iterate over the games, and there I'm performing a join. Because I just get these game, the games where the player has the same ID as the user. And this is how I could do a join. Um, and then I can return the user's name and, for example, the score. Second thing is, I can also modify the documents. Again, I pseudo iterate over all elements using this filter. But the filter is, of course, applied before you iterate over the documents because if it's in the index, it will use the index, so it's fast. Um, and in this um, query, I would, for example, do a migration. So I get wherever the status has the old format, not, not active, I will replace it with active false, which is the new status. <coughs> um, and the last thing is a graph traversal, which is a function, um, where I just say I have a graph, which is called underground plan. And in underground plan, I have several document collections and edge collections. So the edge collections connect all these documents. <coughs> um, and in this query, I want to start at the main station, just want to go in the outbound direction and check which is reachable within two or five stations, which is, for example, important if you are driving with the subway and you buy a ticket, which allows you to ride at most four stations. You can check where you can go. <coughs> Next thing, asset transactions. So everything you do in AQL is transactional by default. But if you want to do a bit more, if you want to write your own code and do some logic that you cannot express in AQL, you can just write a JavaScript function, which is put in, in the action. You can get your logs on the collections that you need. So in this query, I would uh, write on users and products and would only read on recommendations. So whenever I start this transaction, and this transaction, I get whatever is stored in that, that moment. Then I do everything that is stored in action as a JavaScript function. If that works through, everything will be stored and is acidly um, inside the database. And if there is, at some point, a throw for whatever reason, so the internal function fails, then it will automatically do a rollback. And I don't have to care for anything that is broken in my database. <coughs> Yes, please. Does it mean uh, transactions are necessarily batch operations with full table logs? Um, not really. We have multi-version concurrency control, so you just get the only thing that you really need um, in your query to get logged. But you don't see newer versions of these objects. <coughs> okay. And now let's talk about Fox the JavaScript uh, framework that we in included. So the idea of Fox that you can encapsulate microservices right inside your database, offer them via an API. Um, what you can do, for example, is aggregate data and enforcing privacy or con security constraints. So for example, you can cut out some data that you would not want to deliver um, to your user, or you can, for example, apply some um, decryption, encryption functionality um, add some further information from other queries or whatever directly on the database level, and then just put out the complete result to the user. <coughs> um, then you could also use it to trigger logic on data modification. So whenever you want to store something, you just go over a Fox route. Um, it adds some further information to that, for example, encrypting the user password or whatever, um, and then stores it to the database. Um, and the idea of these Fox apps is that you write them small, so you put them in your own version control, and you can require them from other Fox apps. So for example, if you have a user management tool, you write this one once, and require it from different applications that you write. And you always get the features of this one user module. <coughs> um, other things you can do with that is to improve your multi-device setup. So um, nowadays you just have like iPhones or whatever, tablets or PCs, um, and if you are, for example, in a mobile setup, then you typically do not want this whole load of data pushed to your client. If you are in an office setup, you maybe want that. Um, so you can actually decide on this level already, do I have to crunch something down, write that one time in my application, 
and then just ship the short result. And I do not have to write the same thing on my iPhone, on my Android, and on my wherever, uh, multi, uh, um, wherever device to just crunch this data down or trigger a different route. You can just use the same route and write it once and for all in your database. <coughs> so you get the correct data format for your device. <coughs> um, then you can also secure your data in Fox, so you can just use um, further uh, authentication algorithms um, or whatever authentication you need. So we have built in OAuth 2 or HTTP basic OAuth. Um, then one benefit you get is that you have low network traffic uh, and direct data access. So you just push out the data piece that you actually need in your application. You do not push out any more and have to filter it on application level. <coughs> um, and that's why you can add your own customized and versioned REST API in JavaScript onto a RangoDB, which is uh, then the API that you would actually expect from your database, or which you need from your database. OK, so now let's go back to the benefits and overhead of the polyglot persistence setup. So benefits, native mapping into, uh, of, data into, uh, of data into your database, it's still given, because you can store documents, you can store graphs, you can store um, key values natively. Um, database is still optimized for these formats. <coughs> and you get queries for all of them. Um, but on the overhead side, we can have a uh, closer look. So data has to be stored redundantly and has to be, stored, uh, has to be kept in sync. Um, actually, we don't need that anymore because that will be done in the database level. So you don't have to enforce that it is in sync or something because you really use the same objects. You don't have to copy them yourself. <coughs> Several technologies involved, well, that's also not true. You use one multimodal database and that's it. And therefore, administration effort is huge. It's also not true anymore. So we could get, for this part of the view, into keeping the benefits, but all these overhead I told you is not valid for multimodal database anymore. Yes, please. Um, that depends on your, st on your setup. So we have replication algorithm if you want to replicate it for, for backup. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the idea is that a graph query can access documents. And edges to the outside appear also as documents. So you actually have in your edge, have a pointer to the starting document and the um, target document. And you do not have additional documents stored in there. If you have a different graph database, you need to store these vertices in addition. But now we can use the documents that we already store. And that's the benefit. So there's actually no redundancy you need for that. OK? Um, yeah. Then give me the chance to give you an overview of some more features that we offer with ArangoDB uh, in particular. So the complete project is open source and free with Apache 2 license. You can just download it, check it out from GitHub, build it yourself, and just try it. And we have one-click installers for all the um, operating systems, including Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and I think we also have a Raspberry Pi version, if you like it. Um, then we have built-in sharding and replication. So replication for your backup strategy, and sharding if you have more data than it would fit on one server. Um, then we have drivers for a wide range of languages, including Java, Ruby, JavaScript, of course, um, Python, um, and PHP. Um, then we have a rep front end, which is shipped um, with a RangoDB, and you don't have to pay extra for that. Just get it for free. Um, then we have a documentation, which is made with Gitbooks, um, which I think is quite nice now. Um, and we offer you professional as well as community support for the database. <clears throat> and, well, if you like it, you can be invited to join our growing community by using RangoDB or contributing to it. And if you have further questions, you can just contact me. Um, and all these green fields is at least one contribution coming from, from all over the world into RangoDB. So we are quite global now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. If you have further questions, I will be around today in the JavaScript track, which I'm organizing on the upper store, upper floor, and now I'm available here. So, any questions? Yeah.
Yes, please. Could you say something about the performance characteristics of RMD because you are ACID, but you allow sharding? Yes. Yes, um, so the asset is you can enable it or disable it. Okay. Uh, you can do that on um, doc, um, collection level and on uh, query level. So if you want to say this one query has to be super fast, but I don't care if it's asset or not, you can just disable it for that query. And if you have like financial data or something, just enable that and it's good. But then it, it takes, of course, a bit longer. But in typical use case, you actually for asset queries, you can actually wait because they are not time critical. And for time critical queries, you don't want to wait. So that is, um, you can uh, configure that on, on your needs. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, but you can. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, if you're afraid of losing that, you could just use ArrangoDB in all these states and set up a different database for each of them. Then you have the same setup as before. Okay, which does not really help you, but it's <laughs> okay, you can do that. Um, but the other thing is that uh, we have this built-in sharding and built-in replication. So if you use your setup, use one large database in some cloud environment or sharded environment or something, um, then it appears like one da large database. But you actually get, this, uh, again, the benefit that you have different servers storing your data. And you could just throw away that one server and replace it by the other one. So. Yeah, you could. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if I really get, got your point, um, but you can use the same, uh, the idea of these, these microservices that you could deploy them on all your machines. So if you throw away one of them, it will still be available on the other ones. And you just have to make a backup of your data and then still have the same microservice available on all your machines. Um, and then it's actually transparent to which one of these machines you connect, but it would be faster if you connect to the right one because then you don't have the network traffic anymore. Um, mm -hmm. um, so our target is, is also all the um, servers into, in the same data center. So if you're in the same data center, you can use all the machines that are there. Um, actually, the, the target we would suggest would be like four or eight machines, something in that, that region, but you could do more. So there is no hard limit in using like 200 machines. But if you are using different data centers across the, the world, um, then you always have this uh, network latency that you have to take into account for queries that um, actually use more than one server in the setup. But you could do that, but you have to live with that, or either shard your data such that everything that would be requested from Europe stays in Europe, and all the things that are requested from the US are in the US. And then you could connect them in the, in the global scale, to have some more advanced features, if you really have some queries that are across these um, countries, then you could do that. And yeah, for example, then he, he could still get the, the data from, from US in, in Europe or whatever. Yes, please. Um, Uh, 
Um, I'm, I think not yet, but that is definitely on our road list. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we don't have that yet. Or, Frank, we don't have it. Okay. <coughs> Yes. Are there any best, best practices for managing dependent migrations? Like what can one microdog do to get embedded in your machine so you migrate data to make the microdogs not that you have them, but to down so you pretty much get the help of dependent data migration? Yeah, yeah, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you get. Um, right now, um, there is nothing that we have published, but we are working on recipes. And we will publish them in the future, and that is one of the use cases that we will consider in these re uh, recipes. And then it's there. <laughs> okay? Yes, please. So, so my opinion is um, that I don't think it will get as fast as the NoSQL databases are because they are built from, from scratch to support these features. And uh, for a relational database, you just build something on top that simulates a NoSQL database. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I never trust these benchmarks because yeah, most of them are, are really. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but, but I, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think both parties really learn from each other and try to get to the one solution, <laughs> and that's it. So it is, both of them are, are valid approaches. Um, but I must say, if you really have no SQL data, then you best use a no SQL database and not something that simulates it. That's my opinion. Okay, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>